Okay, I call this meeting the order and welcome to the Tuesday, March 21st, uh, 2017 informational meeting here at the Carnegie Town Hall. And uh, the first item on the agenda is City Council open discussion. Do we have any open discussion topics? Councilor Erickson. I'll be very brief. Um, I'm sure you all saw it in the news. Um, as we talk about um, prevention and drugs in our community, um, recently there was, it was on the Argus 911 today about a 12 year old um, child um, that was caught selling marijuana at his middle school. And so I bring that up because as we continue to talk about prevention, we clearly have a problem. This is the first time someone so young has been um, caught in our schools. And so I just bring it up to let my fellow counselors know and challenge you as we move forward with prevention, we try to identify those measurable ideas and things that we can do to make sure that we can get a grasp on this in our community. So that's it. Thank you. We appreciate your continued efforts in that in that area. Any other items? Councillor Starr. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to publicly say thank you to the Public Works Department. Many of us had a chance last week to uh, watch a 72-inch uh, uh, sewer line being put in under Cliff Avenue and the boring that uh, was done. What was interesting was one of the uh, Public Works engineers asked the operator of the, the equipment what, uh, what happens if you hit a boulder as you're trying to bore through underneath Cliff Avenue. And the, the gentleman's a little bit older and he just kind of looked and kind of looked at this guy and he goes, we crush it. And so as it must be engineer humor by the time we're done. So, but uh, thank you to Director Cotter to include us in that. I know when we look at a, a $15 million project, we wonder what's happening and, and having the opportunity to go out in the field and actually see the work that's being done and the services that we provide to the community, it, uh, it uh, warms, warms my heart. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Any other items for open discussion? Councillor Selberg. Thank you. I want to give a shout out to the Pothole Hotline. I don't know if people out there remember that it's there, but uh, my daughter and I must have been bored the other day. We decided to go hunting for potholes, so we drove around uh, the southwest part of town and got a pretty good list, and we called it in, and the next day I drove by, and they were all fixed. So I know especially this time of year you see more and more of them and I know complaining about the roads is kind of popular too even though I think for the most part we've got pretty good roads but again don't forget the pothole hotline 367-8002. So put that on your dialer and if you see a hole give them a call they do a great job. Good job counselor and to your daughter too. Yeah all right. Any, any other items for open discussion? I, I just have two reminders. Um, next Tuesday, we will have a work session for the City Council uh, dealing with our policy and procedure manual, and that's coming out of the Operations Committee, and you should have received that information. I believe it was just sent out uh, earlier today for you to review and uh, make any comments, either before or at the time of the work session. And uh, additionally, uh, Tuesday, April 11th, I just wanted to mention it, probably we'll bring it up again during the Land Use Committee, but I wanted to mention it during the full council meeting here at the informational that uh, Tuesday, April 11th, we have our first uh, annexation task force uh, meeting. So those that are interested, uh, please join us. That will be held at the main library, meeting room B, uh, at two o'clock in the afternoon, scheduled for two to 3.30. Councillor Staley. And following up on that with uh, the annexation topic, I did request that um, that department would put together a tour, um, and I think there's been several council members who have responded to that, so that we can go around and actually see those areas that are being considered in our community for annexation, and it'll help us to make a better decision about what to uh, kinds of uh, items will be put on the on the docket for for mandates for these people so i appreciate that we've got that happening thank you councillor staley i am one of the individuals that signed up for that so thanks for bringing that uh, forward any other uh, items for open discussion okay seeing none then we're going to move on into our presentations and the first presentation is our follow-up to fuel control and that's going to be presented by our, our internal auditor ashley so ashley welcome 
Thank you. Good afternoon. I am Ashley Sroshine, internal auditor for the city of Sioux Falls. This audit report was approved last week by the audit committee. The purpose of this audit was to follow up on the three recommendations from the 2011 audit to determine if there are opportunities for improvement and to determine if outside agencies are billed properly. A little bit on the background of the fuel operations. The fleet division spends over a million dollars a year on fuel to operate its vehicles and equipment. They also sell fuel to the county, the school district, and a few other agencies. Each city department and the outside agencies pay for the fuel they use, plus a 6% markup fee. There are four fuel stations located throughout the city, and they can only be accessed by swiping both a vehicle card and an operator card. All fuel revenues and expenses are reported in the Fleet Revolving Fund on the city's financial statements. For the results of Objective 1, we determined that one of the three prior audit recommendations were in place. The two recommendations that were not implemented resulted in audit, audit finding 1 and audit finding 2. Therefore, we again recommended that a fuel inventory reconciliation be completed on a monthly basis and that proper controls be put into place to ensure the fuel card database is accurate and up to date. Management agreed with both the recommendations and said they would implement them by February 2017. For the results of objective two, which was to determine if the fleet department was following leading practices, we noted that using a percent markup fee is not recommended and it does not consider, or as it does not consider the fluctuation in fuel prices. This resulted in recommendation three which is to, cha to charge a fixed markup fee on the number of gallons used. Management agreed and they now charge a markup of 10 cents per gallon. On page five, we also noted three opportunities for improvement that the fleet department may want to consider to increase the efficiency of the fuel operations. For the results of objective three, which was to determine if outside agencies are billed properly for the use of the city's fuel, we noted that they are being billed properly on a monthly basis. And that concludes my presentation, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Ashley. Any questions for Ashley regarding this report? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much. And we'll move on to our next topic of discussion. 2017 uh, Sculpture Walk Program presentation. And welcome. Welcome. Russ Sorensen with the City of Sioux Falls Planning Office. With me this afternoon is Jim Clark, Executive Director for the Sculpture Walk. And the Sculpture Walk program is in its 14th year, believe it or not. And uh, I just want you to know that several service departments, including Human Services and uh, ADA Accessibility Review Board, Public Works, Risk Management and Planning, along with the Visual Arts Commission, have immensely endorsed the 2017 program. At this time, we'd like to have Jim Clark unveil the 2017 program. We'll be back later this evening uh, as well. Okay, thank you very much, thank Russ. You. Welcome, Jim. You're going to be a very busy man coming uh, soon here. Thank you, uh, Council Vice Chair. Thanks, Russ, for the intro. Yeah, it's good to be here uh, to introduce Sculpture Walk 2017. This is going to be our 14th year, hard to believe. Time flies. Over the first 13 years, we've had 666 sculptures go through downtown Sioux Falls. 168 of those, plus a few commission pieces, have been sold. Uh, we have satellite programs. Uh, Avera McKinnon Hospital has 15 sculptures. University of Sioux Falls has 12 sculptures. And there are currently 24 other leases around town. This year, we had 120 entries from all over the country. Uh, the top 56 and a few alternates have been selected for 2017, and uh, I'll show those to you. Uh, we'll have 50 artists from 17 states and one from Canada. Over the years, past years, we've had artists from China, England, France, Italy, Nigeria, and Cuba. Uh, 14 artists are new to Sculpture Walk. It's good to get new artists every year for variety. Five artists are from Sioux Falls, 10 are from South Dakota. The photos on the, on the PowerPoint um, 
are photos that we have received from the artist with their entries. So some are good, some aren't so good. PowerPoint shows the sculptures, but not the sites, because we're still working on the sites, on, on where they're going to go. Uh, the sites will be pretty much the same as 2016, though, and, but there might be one or two that are new. So let's start with the, uh, the sculptures. In Love with the Sky, Serge Mosnevsky has a large sculpture, and we have uh, many more large sculptures this year. Uh, and maybe they just seem larger because we're 15, 14 years older than when we started, and they're heavier, for sure, because we're 14 years older. Uh, Serge Mosnevsky is from Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, and uh, his work is aluminum, 10 foot high. Uh, Bruce Stillman uh, is from uh, Minnesota, new artist. I identified the new artist with blue font. Uh, his sculpture is Eclipse, stainless steel and rock. And it is connected, kinetic, and we, we make sure that all of our sculptures that are kinetic are placed out of harm's way. So we have had a few places, pieces like that have not had any problems. But it does swing a little bit with the wind. Hard Hat Joe, uh, many of you are familiar with Sherry Treby, Lee Looning. They uh, did all the uh, war memorial sculptures in Pier. They've won People's Choice in Sculpture Walks several times. And they have two sculptures in Sculpture Walk this year. Play With Me, Heidi Hoy is from Minnesota. Uh, her sculpture is bronze. Everybody likes dogs. Ickeson, uh, Gary Monaco, uh, undertook this sculpture uh, a couple years ago. He's been working on this for a couple years, and I think that's why the price is so high. Big sculpture, 12 uh, feet long. Uh, it's a challenge to cite these big ones, but I think we've got, got to figure it out. Uh, he went through 10 a pair of leather gloves on this first part of the sculpture, just putting the hair on it. So uh, I, I can't wait to see him when he gets here after finishing it. But uh, it's a spectacular piece. He does spectacular work. Rabbit Rock, Anthony Guntron has had uh, sculptures the last two or three years with us. I'm not sure what this is going to end up looking like, but uh, we have, a, we have a, a selection committee of about eight that select the sculptures, and again, for quality and variety. And uh, even though we can't tell what this will be, we'll, we know that it will be high quality because we know his work, steel and stone. My little dear, uh, Christine Knapp from Colorado. We get a lot of artists from Colorado just because the foundries are out there and it's a nice place to live and work. Red bronze sculpture. School of Spirit, Steve Borm had a wonderful exhibit recently at the pavilion. And uh, this piece may or may not be illuminated. We try to put his works where we can plug them in. We got two in 2016. And uh, he works with found objects. Little Cowboy, Larry Stark, uh, he's from Colorado. He won uh, People's Choice a couple years ago with uh, the Farmer sculpture, uh, a bronze. Salmon Runner. Um, Hi, Heather Wall, new artist from uh, British Columbia, Canada. Her work is just spectacular. But this is what she, the, the sketch that she entered. Plus, whenever we get a sketch, we ask for uh, photos of her other works. And uh, that's what we got. And uh, everybody will be pleasantly surprised with her work. Very unique and different. Uh, Willow Gregory Mendez is from Indiana. Has been in Sculpture Walk a few years. You might recognize his work. An 11 foot tall sculpture. Grandma's hat, Bobby Carlisle from Colorado, has been in Sculpture Walk several years. Uh, Love Sculpture Walk comes back every year uh, for, it has been for several years. A smaller, this one and this one, smaller pieces, but both very good. And the smaller pieces often will elevate them on black boxes. Sitting Panther, this is the clay version of uh, Eric Thorson's uh, sculpture. Uh, he is from Western Montana and uh, always does spectacular work. Whirlwind of Life, Travis Sorensen, he is a new uh, artist from uh, Belfouche and uh, does, from, does great work. Uh, so this is the first one we're gonna have of his in stainless steel. Fish Kebabs, Robert Bruce uh, sculpture, he's from Sioux Falls and this is an aluminum sculpture. Uh, he always does very good work. 
uh, music, Sherry Treby and, and Lee Looning's second sculpture in Sculpture Walk. Uh, they won People's Choice 2016 with the Maestro, which is standing in front of uh, the State Theater. Very popular piece. We had to move that because uh, we got some complaints. It was so loud because everybody that walked by played it. And from the bank and the law office upstairs, it interrupted their phone calls every day. So. This one we'll have to put where it's not near an office or, or an apartment. But it, but it is chimes in the dress. Eclipse, uh, Tim James and Aiden Damaris, they're, they're from uh, Wisconsin, new artists. That's a steel piece. Dime Tremorph, I think is the right way to pronounce that. Tim Cassidy from Minnesota, new artist. Functional art. The neat piece, really like this one. This is the biggest one we've ever had, 20 feet wide, 10 feet in depth. Uh, it's going to be a challenge to cite this one. We're not putting it on public property because we can't. Uh, so we're going to put it on private if we can find it. We're still looking for a site for it. And if you remember the helicopter last year uh, that ended up on 8th Street, that was a challenge up until about the last day and we found that spot. Uh, that sculpture uh, was purchased by RNL Supply, so it's going to stay there. So this one uh, will surprise you. Let's hope we can find a spot for it here over the next few weeks. Uh, same artist, Dale Lewis, when pigs fly the right way. It's really a neat piece. Woman in the Wind, Kim Feeberger from uh, Minneapolis. Uh, she has done eggs over the years, very colorful eggs. This is uh, a new style for her, eight feet high. Uh, we really like it. Nucleus, Jeff Satter, Sioux Falls artist. We didn't know about Jeff until he sent his entry in to us. We were surprised. Where have you been? And uh, so this, we accepted this one into Sculpture Walk, and uh, we have another one, I think, as an alternate. But even this one is big. Awesome Mind, uh, Osamid Obazi, originally from Nigeria, lives in California now, and he's done sculptures over the years for Sculpture Walk. Loves Sculpture Walk. He travels to Sioux Falls every year from California. And uh, he's won uh, Best of Show Awards two or three years. By the Emergent, Sue Quinlan is from uh, Colorado. And this is concrete and uh, steel, the only concrete artist that we have. Reflective Moments, Ruth G, new artist from Michigan, bronze sculpture, nice figurative piece. Fewer kids sculptures this year than in the past, more abstract. Unity, uh, Mir Eagle from Washington, and this has that glass in the middle of the steel sculpture. Kind of scary, uh, but uh, it's a big piece, 10 feet high. Della Capri's Clark Martin, another artist we didn't know about, is from Mitchell. And this is iron. So our first, I think it's our first iron piece in Sculpture Walk. Uh, Louisa Altman is from New Jersey. She ships her sculptures out every year. I don't know if she's ever been here, but most of our artists travel to Sioux Falls. So we have 50 artists this year, um, and I think 49 are, well, except for her, I think 48 or 49 are gonna travel to Sioux Falls. With their, some ship and travel, and some just bring their sculptures with them. This is stainless sculpture, big, another big piece. Uh, Bent, uh, David Score is a professor at a Connecticut college, and he travels out here every year with his sculptures and picks up what he's had here. Stops and picks up his brother in Indiana. It's a long drive. Now, Big Mac, now this one is uh, in process. Uh, it's going to be colorful, I think, because his work usually is. He's, Neil is from uh, Indiana. Uh, now, just another nice size sculpture. Actually changed the name on me, but I couldn't change it on this PowerPoint. <clears throat> Ascending Perspectives, Craig Schneider uh, from Minneapolis is back. He's been gone for a couple years. Order 6, uh, Will Vanderson is from Kansas City. And uh, this is his style of sculpture. We have, we have one this year like it. This is bigger, quite a bit bigger, galvanized steel. Fitzroy's guitar, uh, Alex Mendez, new artist this year, uh, Gregory's brother. And we did confirm with him that this could not be bent or vandalized. I mean, I suppose 
spray paint could do it, but it, he says no one can bend it. So it's a 14 foot tall sculpture. We always try to confirm with the artist, is there any vandalism risk with these sculptures? Because we don't want it, they don't want it. Um, and so uh, from all that you've seen so far and what you're gonna see going forward, we're pretty confident that it can't be broken. Unless there's two or three people doing it, I guess, or a car hits them. Growth of postmodern uh, four by Guy Belliver out of uh, Chicago area. Uh, he has been in Sculpture Walk in previous years, but it's been so long, I still consider him a new artist. Geronimo by uh, Dawn Record from Colorado, a, a marble sculpture, new artist. Actually, I think she's, yeah, I think she's from Colorado. I was thinking she might be from Utah. We have quite a few artists from Utah. Wild Horses, Heidi Hoy's uh, second sculpture. And uh, we do know where this one's gonna go because it's a little bit more of a challenge with three figures. Uh, it's across from the diner and the big planter, which is in front of First National Bank. It's a big, huge planter there. We have a big concrete pad, so the three horses will fit on the one pad at uh, mm, probably three foot high, I think it is. Passing time, Lynn Peterson is from Byburn. And he won the very first People's Choice Award with the, with the goose that is uh, standing in Falls Park West that greets all the visitors going into the Falls Park. Reawakening Zeal, uh, Lauren Clark from Utah, Pink Marble. These two will go together. Sometimes age forgets, and uh, I'm still me from Ray Cobalt from Chicago. <clears throat> Pecos, Wayne Salds, he has his own style, and it's uh, uh, very popular, uh, very unique, very popular, the Pecos Brown sculpture. He's been featured in Southwest Art Magazine. Generations Ben Hammond, he does a portrait bust for the National Football Hall of Fame. So he, he did Jan, John Randall for one, and he's done several, several portrait busts that are now standing in the NFL Hall of Fame, so pretty good sculptor. Generation three, Nathan Johansson, a few years ago, a couple years ago, he had uh, the uh, dandelion, the 15 foot tall dandelion. Very, very good artist. Century Jade Wendell, we have two of his works uh, now in Sculpture Walk, and uh, he's bringing this one, another tall piece. His mule marble is his uh, material. When Buffalo Rome, Jerry McKellar's from Washington, a very intricate Native American piece. Uh, he's had a lot of success out west, southwest with Native American sculptures. And uh, he's, a, he's actually a retired dentist that uh, took up sculpture when he was still practicing and then continued it after he retired. And he's very good. Fish at Play, Pat Vader is from California. A uh, fun sculpture, whimsical. It, it moves, it's whimsical, 14 feet high. Great Gray Owl, Eric Thorson's second sculpture in Sculpture Walk. Looking at the clay version of it. Bigger bait, John Hughes, uh, whimsical sculpture, big, big bait, bigger bait. He is from uh, Minnesota, so it's painted scrap metal. Bull, uh, Long Hao Zhu is from China and now lives in Arkansas, and uh, just a great sculptor and painter as well. Um, and we're very fortunate to have him in Sculpture Walk. This is his second sculpture in, in Sculpture Walk. Crazy Eight, Stephen Mack has been in Sculpture Walk a few years. He's from Florida. Stories of Survivors and Friends, Robert Brubaker is from Arizona, and you've seen his work in Sculpture Walk over the last couple of years. Starts with three, Tom Ford, Wyoming. Colorful piece. Big fish, now this is, this is a big fish. A Jacques Frizy, uh, artist out of Millbank, uh, he's had sculptures like these over the years. He's not in 16, I don't know if he was in 15, but he's back. And uh, another sculpture that's kind of hard to figure out where we're gonna put it. Clean Water Brings Life, Lynette Power uh, from uh, Minnesota. 
Everybody likes otters. Solitude, Tuck Langlin uh, from Indiana, new artist this year. Praise Song, Q, Guy Bolivar's second sculpture. That's good to have some colorful sculptures. Thorns, Bees, and Rhinos, and a kind of a whimsical piece from Nathan Johansson. They all have thorns or, or, or sharp points. And the alternates, I'll go through these quickly. Cascade, David Scora. Corkscrew by Pat Vader, almost seven feet high, powder coated aluminum and steel. Bell Insouciance, James Maher from the Black Hills area. Uh, James did the Lincoln sculpture we had last year that was purchased by the uh, Lincoln alumni group and uh, now stands in Lincoln High School. Nexus, Sam Spixa from Minnesota. Priestess, Heidi Hoy. Now this one actually has been leased by Vermilion. We also have a relationship with Vermilion. They lease four sculptures downtown. University of South Dakota leases seven from us, and Watertown leases 11 from Sculpture Walk. Soul Aspect, uh, Lauren Clark from Utah. Garden Fairy Small Sculpture from Sandra Johnson. She's in Nebraska, but she's had sculptures in Sioux Falls. In fact, uh, her uh, sculpture, The Farmer, is down at the Visitor Center at, at Falls Park. Wild Thing, Heidi Hoy. Ancient Game, Stephen Mack. Fair Shoe, Molly Barrett from Minnesota. It's eight, that would be an eight foot tall shoe. <laughs> Tight Curb by uh, Jeff Satter. Another nice sculpture by Jeff. Tango One, Robert Mickelman from Missouri. Lost in Space by Jed Nelson. And those are the sculptures for Sculpture Walk 2017. Jim, thank you. Comments or questions for uh, Mr. Clark? Yes, Councillor Neitzer. Just as an education, could you tell me what it means to be an alternate? If one of these, top, one of the top 56 uh, falls out for whatever reason, could be sold by the artist. Um, I've had artists call the 11th hour and say, hey, uh, I can't make it because I've got I've got hurt, I'm ill, or I have a situation in the family. We, I can't make it to Sioux Falls, so then we call an alternate. Okay, and then um, what if one sees one and says, I, "Geez, I I, I really got to have this thing." What is the process by which somebody actually purchases one of these? Well, they call me. We get a down payment. We hold it until the end of the year, or I'll call I, and I will contact the artist right away and let them know. But I'll also offer to the, to the buyer and to the artist, hey, he might be able to make a copy of it, particularly if it's a bronze, they can do another casting of it. If it's steel, that'd be, that's a different story. But if it's bronze, they can make another casting of it. And that actually happened this year with the sculpture that's in front of Minerva's. I was uh, vacationing in Boston, got a call uh, from a lady that was traveling. They, she and her husband had retired from the military, they were traveling from Yellowstone through Sioux Falls to their home in uh, uh, Virginia. And she said, we want to buy that sculpture that was standing in front of Minerva's. Great. So I negotiated it and, uh, and uh, told her that, well, if you want this one, you have to wait until April when we take them down, or he might be able to cast another one. He cast another one for her, sent it to her, and uh, I handled the whole transaction. And, now she has a sculpture, he made a sale, we made a commission. It worked out well. Any other questions? Councillor Staley. Well, first of all, I, I had the pleasure of hearing the history of how you got involved with this last spring at the CVB uh, luncheon. And I just wanna say I appreciate the time you spend as a volunteer to put this together well, because you. you said it was your passion to bring this to our community. Um, and just a little briefing on mechanics, and, and Councillor Neisser kind of touched on that. Um, I'd like to know how many of these usually sell in a season, and then what is the turnaround date for how does that mechanically work when they're removed and new ones are put in? Good question. We've sold 168 over the years. 
Some years we've sold 11, 12, 13, 15. Other years we've sold two or three or four. So it's, um, it varies year to year. Um, turnaround, we take the 16 sculptures down on April 22nd. And in between the 22nd and May 6th, we change out the nameplates, clean up the pedestals, paint the pedestal tops, get everything ready to go, put up the new brochure boxes. May 6th is when we set up the new ones. The artists come in on May 5th, and we have a party for them that evening. And then also, uh, uh, we, you know, they get to enjoy Sioux Falls in the afternoon, and then we have another party Saturday night. And we try to take real good care of them. Thank you. Thanks. Councillor Selberg. Thank you. Um, I don't think we got a handout on this, but did I see right that that, that Buffalo is $250,000? That's correct. We do insure the sculpture, so that's going to bump up our premium, I think. But uh, So a city, a, 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 he makes us hoping that a city or somebody will buy that? Or no, just no, it's just we get it on loan. We, we pay all the artists a $1,000 honorarium. Uh, so he comes for 1000 hoping that he's going to sell it or win best of show. Uh, I don't think the city purchases the people's choice for up to 20,000. Uh, there are many sculptures that get purchased that are actually valued at 30, 35, but the artist wants to participate in the people's choice voting and it's good for the resume if they win. But we've purchased several sculptures for 20,000. They're worth a lot more. Now, when we get up into the 70, 80,000 and higher, they don't want to participate in people's choice. They don't want to sell it for 20000 So they just check. We ask all of them, do you want to participate? So, and then they keep them up for a year, and we hope to sell or lease. We lease a lot of sculptures, and uh, maybe maybe he'll sell it. But they, they like participating in Sculpture Walk. Yeah. So we, we do insure all the sculptures for comp and collision, I call it, uh, and also liability for the public. So... None of our artists, if any of the sculptures are vandalized, like what happened, uh, not so much this year. I don't know if we've had much this year, but last year we had some. Our deductible is 2500 so that cost Sculpture Walk 2500 because uh, the damage was more than $2,500. So we don't anticipate that kind of expense, but it happens. And uh, we don't want any of the artists to experience any losses at any time. Any other questions or comments? I have just a couple, 14th year, it's hard to imagine that it's already been 14 years and I know that you've invested a lot of work into this, Jim, and you're, you're the one that's really deserves the credit for making this a successful program. So thank you very much for your Thanks. efforts there. We have a good board, good volunteers that make it happen. You do, you do have a lot of volunteers, so they'll be taking them down and setting them up and also transporting um, sculptures that have been purchased to other Correct. locales yeah. as well, too. Correct. So uh, thank you very much for, for your effort in that in that regard. I mean, at least with some of these larger uh, sculptures, uh, once we have our Levitt Pavilion, that'll give you an, mm -hmm. a, a, a bigger venue in the Falls Park right. West area, too, for, for some of those. So we do have some potential there. I, my uh, biology background, especially like Germination Three. Mm -hmm. What a great sculpture! Yeah, it is as it's pushing up through the soil and mm -hmm. or asphalt, whatever that might be depicting. But um, the great owl. Uh, I saw another sculpture in the background. Looks familiar to sculptures that are over at the Prairie Center. Is it the same artist? Uh, no. Okay, Eric. Um you know, the little children splashing in the rain with their raincoats. My wife and I traveled. Uh, my son was at uh, Camp Flathead Lake, and that's how we found Eric, because he and another artist, both sculptors, were at uh, Big Fork, Montana, which is right on the lake. Eric, has, his studio is full of sculptures, very prolific sculptor. That was at his studio, so that was a sculpture in, that he's done in the background. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And regarding the People's Choice Award, I think it was uh, wise that somebody had the foresight to put a $20,000 limit on, on those with a $250,000 buffalo. Right. Uh, we could be reappropriating <laughs> funds, uh, potentially. So, Jim, great. Yeah. I, this is always one of my favorite presentations of the year. And uh, thank you very much, yeah. and thank you to the arts community for making this happen. Thank you, and thanks for your, all your support. Okay, now, tough act to follow, but I'm sure Mr. Tobias is up for the task. 
because Code Enforcement 2016 Annual Report is, is up next. Yeah, that is a tough act to follow. I'll, I'll give you that. So, um, good afternoon, Council Vice Chair, Council um, Matt Tobias from Planning and Building Services, Code Enforcement Manager. Um, today, I just want to go through um, our 2016 Code Enforcement Annual Report. This is kind of uh, my time of year to come up here and tell you all the good things that uh, Code Enforcement did throughout the year. Um, but I would be remiss if I didn't introduce some of my fellow Code Enforcement Managers that are with me tonight. So, I'll start over here. Shauna Goldhammer from Zoning. She's, Shauna's on the Code Enforcement Manager's team. Luann Ford from Health. Bonnie Woolham is our um, new paralegal in the city attorney's office. And Bonnie's been an excellent help so far. Um, Mike Cooper from Director of Planning Building Services. Um, Kyle Johnson, Officer Kyle Johnson um, with PD. Adam Roach with Community Development. And Dean Lanier with uh, Sioux Falls Fire. Um, I can't say um, enough for our team because this is not... Um, it's not a one-man show. Um, our management team, we get together every single, every two weeks we get together um, through a long list of properties and things that come up through those two weeks where we're not meeting. So um, we, we take time and go through every, anything related to code enforcement. So I can't thank those guys enough for all that they do for the team, so. Um, the code enforcement um, team mission statement, um, I'll just kind of read this, it's important. This was developed prior to me coming here, but it's a very important mission statement. Um, the code enforcement team is dedicated to enhancing the quality of life for citizens of Sioux Falls by administering environmental, fire, housing, building, electrical, plumbing, mechanical, property maintenance, zoning, vegetation, health, sanitation, and nuisance ordinances. We are committed to serving the community in a safe, professional, and effective manner. The program provides equal service to the complainant and violator with the intent of receiving the ultimate goal, which is compliance. Um, that is our ultimate goal. Um, through code enforcement, you know, we have in my title, it says code enforcement manager. You know, enforcement sounds, it is what it is. But our, our ultimate goal is compliance. I mean, that's always going to be our goal. Um, I was at a conference recently, and, I, and I, this, I saw this quote, and I thought it was really important. I, that's why I put it in the presentation. Uh, your most unhappy customers are the greatest, your greatest source of learning. Code enforcement. I don't think we, we deal with a lot of unhappy customers. That's just kind of the nature of the beast. Um, but they are a great source of learning. I myself, I know that I take, whenever, whenever, I, whenever I'm with someone on the phone, I listen to them and I do learn from, from their, their problems or we learn something from how we handle the situation here. So I saw that and I thought, and of course it came from Bill Gates, so no surprise. Um, but that's, it was important enough to me that I, that I thought it should have a place in the presentation here today. So. Um, our efforts, uh, this is kind of the, the big, this is where we start the presentation off with. Our total penalties issued in 2016, $140,100. Total penalties collected in full in 2016, 65,600. Um, penalties being collected through assessments is 30,316. This is a snap of our code enforcement website. Um, with any typical website, it's where we direct all of our traffic. If I'm on the phone with someone and they have a question, I immediately ask them if they have access to the internet and I, we walk through the website. It's a constant, it's, we, we constantly are, you know, we need to be changing this thing and getting up-to-date information on there. Um, it's just a, it's always a work in progress, but um, SiouxFalls.org slash code enforcement will get you there. Um, it's where we have a lot of information out there. Um, rental registration program um, in 2016 and, and actually into 2017, it's time for the city staff, I said city staff, but it's actually council staff and code enforcement staff and their, our attorney staff. We're taking a look at our, our current rental registration ordinance we have on the books. Um, it's a requirement that ordinance is a, it's a requirement that all rental properties be registered with the city. It's been around for I think probably at least 10 or more years. The goal is to have every property registered, every rental property registered with the city. So we're just kind of, we're taking a look at that ordinance, seeing if we need to just revamp it a little bit. Um, that's something that will probably be coming to you in maybe second quarter in 2017. Um, we'll be bringing that to you. But right now we're just kind of going through that. It is a requirement 
and we think that it's time to tweak the ordinance to get more compliance, to get more rental property owners to register their, their, their units. It's big for code enforcement. Um, it's probably the most important for code enforcement because we get a complaint on a rental house, it's really hard for us to go back to the tenant. And so this is a, it's an, it's an owner, we get a complaint, and actually the, one of the benefits to having your property registered for during snow season, um, if it's a rental unit and we get a complaint at your address, at, your, at the house, and you're registered with the city, our property maintenance inspectors will give you a call. So it's kind of like you're, it's your get out of jail free card. It's, and I, and I, I, I say that because it is, um, it's another way for us to communicate with you. And if there's anything that uh, we want to beef up is our communication with our, the complainants, the violators. And that's one thing we, we pride ourselves on. Um, I can, I, I, I'll echo something that Galen Huber said a few weeks ago in a presentation. Um, the response time, I would probably back up the response time of any, any division that works within code enforcement up with anybody else in the country. I think our response time is on point, professional, and very, very quickly. This is another way for us to be able to reach out to the public and actually talk to someone over the phone versus sending letters in the mail. So that's, that's kind of one of our goals. Um, fire prevention and apartment inspections. Um, Sioux Falls Fire Rescue, they do upwards of 250 apartment inspections every single year. Um, we can say in 2016, we had zero fatalities um, through, through, their, through their efforts. Um, we also, in 2016, were, I see that fire is continuing to use the tablets for their inspections. That's one thing that um, through InterGov and through code enforcement, a lot of our inspectors, our property maintenance inspectors are going to be getting, be getting uh, iPods, no, iPads very soon to do their inspections in the field. So anytime we can use technology to help us, it's a great thing. Uh, we have the Growing Resilient campaign that was in the Garfield neighborhood. That's a partnership between Sioux Falls Fire Res Rescue, the Health Department, Community Development, and we were in the Garfield, like I said, Garfield neighborhood in October. We hit almost 1,000 houses in that time frame, um, and that's where fire's going out. They're walking through the neighborhood. They're talking to people about, talking to residents, homeowners about being safe, and they're actually uh, installing smoke alarms in these homes. Public education and outreach is big for us. Um, we have this, this is our who to contact list. It's, I refer to it as our city Bible. It's got, it's pretty much got every division. It's kind of hard to see, but it's got a division that like health is on the top there. And then it's got all the different things that you would call health for. Um, we're fortunate enough to have code enforcement on the bottom of that, of that listing, but it is, a, it's a very, it's an excellent guide. Um, I know Kyle Johnson has taken some and um, handed them out to different police officers. So police officers, so they can hand these out to the public when they're dealing with them. This year, we plan on um, also sending this out in a utility bill. So all of our, all of our residents will get this copy. Um, it's just, once again, it's a, I have one on my desk, and I, and I use it all the time. I look at it almost on a daily basis when I, have, when I get calls for different divisions. So it's a very beneficial thing. Um, the other thing we do that is, um, it's, I think it's, 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 a, it's a very good thing, especially when it comes to code enforcement. You're going to be getting those very soon, but we have a free landfill pass that goes out to every resident. Like I said, I was recently at a conference, um, cities much smaller than Sioux Falls, and they were they couldn't believe that we would actually send out a a free dump pass to our citizens. Um, and we I use that. And if 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 I know that there's a problem and that if we get a complaint um, for some junk in the backyard or whatnot, I'll I'll, I'll always point out to the person and say. Have you used your free, the free dump pass yet? Oh, I can, I can use that for this? Yes, please do. It's, a, it's, a, it's free. So that's something that was established well before I got here, but it's when it comes to code enforcement, to have something like that to offer the services, I mean, that takes, it takes collaboration between multiple different departments, especially public works, but it does help. I think it overall helps our goal with just maintaining compliance, maintain, maintaining a, a clean community. Proactive neighborhood interaction. This is something that um, Adam Roach and myself, and then even Kyle Johnson, and a lot of us, um, we, the uh, neighborhood the associations are kind of, for me, I like to get out to as many of those neighborhood associations as possible and talk about code enforcement. Um, that's an opportunity for me then to sit there and have people bring up complaints. I'll, I'll go to one of those meetings and say, do we have any complaints in 
some associations come with lists if they know if they know code enforcement is going to be there, which is great. And that's it's another way to communicate with the with the residents and let them know the code enforcement's here. And then they, I find myself constantly explaining what code enforcement can do. So it's it's a good thing. We'll, we've done it forever. We'll we'll keep doing it forever because it's getting it's getting out there working with the community. Project nice and keep. Um, this is another one like the free landfill passes that helps out and helps keep our community clean. Um, in 2016, it was April 18th, April 21st, 2016. Um, it was a week long project, and I bolded it there. We actually, uh, the brings, we almost took out 772, 772 tons of unwanted material was removed from these neighborhoods. And once again, when I was at that conference not a few months ago, I, I had a couple of people ask me about Project Nice and Keep, and they couldn't believe that, that the city would do something like that. And before I even came to my position, I was learning about code enforcement, and I remember doing a Google search. And finding, and this is on national website. I mean, it's it's you, you see this. You'll run into Project NASA Keep in Sioux Falls on a very national level. So it's a it's a great thing. We've been doing it for a long time. Um, we're looking forward to this year. It's the last. It's the week of twenty April twenty first. Is it no twenty fourth to the twenty eighth? Is it this year? So we're looking forward to that this year. Hoping for good weather. Um, probably another just as just as successful as last year. So once again, another thing that. It, the, the, what it does for the community is as far as going into a neighborhood. And we actually select, there's a team of us that sits down, and we select these neighborhoods based on complaints. So we're going to neighborhoods that need, they need our help. So it's, 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 it's something else that, um, it's, it's a great thing for the community. We have, with Project Nice and Keep, one of the, one of the awesome things too is we have different neighborhood cleanup that, that spin off from Project Nice and Keep. Here's a group that's been doing this for the last probably seven years. It's, it's a, two, a couple different neighborhood associations. They do a, um, they stick to the railroad as it runs through, or as it runs through our city. Downtown neighborhood association, All Saints, Pettigrew Heights, and 10th and Western. They joined, this past year, they joined forces with Eastside Lutheran Church. Um, and they conducted a, a joint cleanup effort on Saturday morning, October 15th. Once again, it's a group of, they just voluntarily thought it'd be a good idea to clean, the, clean this area up. Well, they do work really closely with Ellison Eastern Railroad. Ellison Eastern is a, is a very, it's their line. Um, I get to work with Ellison Eastern on weed complaints throughout the summertime, but they're, they're very proactive. I mean, as you can see, they had some of their staff out volunteering that day. Um, for this particular cleanup, 900 pounds of waste material was hauled to the landfill, just along the rail lines. We had a couple other cleanups. Um, one of the better ones this year was a, a cleanup that we, I had heard about through Kelloland, um, the, the Frolic Edition. There was a business owner, um, owned, he, there's a guy named Jody Little. He owns Outlaw Tattoos up in the Frolic Edition. Um, Mr. Little took it upon himself to give back to the neighborhood. And he went ahead and rented several dumpsters and placed them throughout the neighborhood and paid for them all himself. He wanted to give back. Uh, we found out about it a couple of days before it happened, and we, and, um, but the, the event was a success. They hauled out. I didn't actually get numbers for how much how material, but I'll say it was a very, very large amount. Um, and Mr. Little, they were, they, they, Kelloland interviewed him, and his main goal was for the cleanup was to have a lasting impact on the look and feel of the residents in the neighborhood. So it's a, it's a, a feel-good story. Love to hear those things. Garfield Edition had another neighborhood cleanup. Garfield Edition, they applied for a community development grant, a project grant to do a cleanup, another successful event. Um, the third paragraph here is, is neighborhood canvas between code enforcement, community development, and crime prevention. This year, I'm going to say that's a small paragraph. I'll tell you that next year, my goal is to have that be a lot bigger. Um, through Adam Roach and Kyle Johnson and myself, um, this came, we had a, we had a, we have, we've had three or four different scenarios where we get a complaint that comes in and it touches code enforcement, police, and neighborhood, neighborhood services. So instead of having us all go out individually on different times, and we kind of do like a shotgun approach. And PD, we had a couple of different complaints this year where there was drug activity, there were some dilapidated houses and whatnot, all in the same. So we just went ahead and we all responded there as quick as possible and took care of the complaint. PD was was great with it um, on a couple different scenarios. They did walkabouts through the neighborhoods um, when there was problems with crime. 
PD, they went ahead and did walkabouts and knocked on doors, said, hey, we're the police department, do you have any complaints? So it's really good when we can do that all together as one. We come in, we come in, we can address those complaints right away. One thing we did this year, which was awesome, was in uh, Pettigrew Heights neighborhood, there was a, we started getting some complaints on lack of lights and, and dark areas in Pettigrew Heights. So through an effort that was kind of led by Kyle, Adam, and myself, um, we worked with um, like Public Works Light and Power to get some LED lights put in. And then once we got the LED lights put in, we found out that there were some trees in the way. So then we, we contacted Parks, and then Parks came out and actually trimmed some of the trees back. So it just, it took an area where we didn't have a whole lot of light, and now it's, it's lit up like you wouldn't believe. So when we had those areas like that, when they're, high, when they're high crime like that, we want to have much light as possible. And that was a really cool project to be involved in this past year. So like I said, I, I really hope that we can, next year, we can, I can come to you with a lot more of those good kind of projects where we, where we worked with multiple different departments and we, there, was a, there was a problem and we corrected it right away. So the um, last thing I threw in here, this is something we've been talking about in neighborhoods, is the parking strip ordinance. Um, you guys are probably all well aware of that, um, but it's something that it's whenever I go out to a neighborhood association, this gets brought up as well. Um, National Night Out was a great success this year. It was August 2nd, 2016. Um, I know there was a bunch of us that went out to the, several different parties. There. I, this year I heard there were 20 different parties that went on. Um, there was a group of us that we attended six of those 20. Um, so it was good to see um, some, of those, some of those events. This is um, some pictures from the Pettigrew Heights. Pettigrew Heights Neighborhood Association, they had, a, they had a band, they had bouncy houses for the kids, they had food, and then the PD was, all, the PD was there. And in this picture, as you can see on the bottom there, this is a, this, the, the police officer is opening up his car doors and giving, letting the kids crawl through, giving the kids a tour. It's really, it's, it's, a, it's an excellent thing to be a part of. This was my first time being a part of a National Night Out. Um, it was good to get out once again with the community and PD's there, and obviously when you say you're from code enforcement, they, they have some questions for you. So, but it's a, it's a great event, and this year was a great success. Um, also this year was the sixth annual Mayor's Neighborhood Summit. Um, this year they, they, we partnered with the Sioux Falls Design Center on the Design Week 2016, and the, I guess the main goal with that is the city developed a sustainability master plan probably about seven years ago. So it was kind of trying to merge that the city sustainability master plan and some of those goals in that master plan with these different neighborhoods and how you could be sustainable. Um, the mayor did another, gave another porch talk again. Um, it was a great, it was, it was, it was very well represented, represented um, annual neighborhood summit this year. So um, real quick, I'll go through some of these city programs. We have a rental rehab, uh, rental rehab program and it began in 2012 and we actually hit eight neighborhoods. I know it says seven in there, but it's actually we hit eight neighborhoods. And this is a program where if it's a rental house, they'll, they can apply for funding to do some work on the house. This is the before and after picture you're gonna see here. Um, this one, this particular um, rental unit applied for some funding and received new windows, new paint, new doors, and new siding. And, no, I should say new paint on the siding and, and a new roof. So it's, it's, a, it's a rental house that needed a little TLC before that, but it qualified for one of our programs. And, it, and it, it's, so, the, so the pictures kind of, pictures tell a lot here with the before and after here. And I know there was a couple different programs, but there were six different properties that we had projects in last year. And so far this year, I think there's been 48 that have been, that have been uh, already approved for 2017. And we get over 150 applications on a yearly basis for those. And those, those are the neighborhoods that they kind of touch. Um, neighborhood revitalization, this is another partnership between community development and they do a partnership with Affordable Housing Solutions. Um, it's, a great, it's a great program because this is also before and after. Um, that house was actually raised um, and then the one on the right was built. So Affordable Housing Solutions does a really good job um, when they when they go in, they'll take a dilapidated home that's been condemned or lost to a, due to a sheriff sale or whatnot, and they'll actually tear it down and build build a house in an affordable housing neighborhood. Um, that's the key element here: is, is we're we're building more affordable housing. We're taking a a problem house, knocking it down, and building something for affordable housing. So 
I know that in 2017, they plan to do, they plan to build 10 of these homes. So once again, I think it helps code enforcement when you have a rundown house in the neighborhood to come in, community development, assist them with the purchasing the property. Um, they'll knock it down and then a new house gets built. And there's some criteria there on, you know, it's sold to, it's, if the homes are sold to households with incomes at or below 80% of the median family income. So it's, once again, it's more of affordable housing. Also, um, this year, affordable housing is working with community development to do a multifamily building at uh, South Summit and West 10th Street. And they're looking to finish that this year too. Um, building demolitions, and then I also put notice of vacate in here. Um, we didn't actually tear any houses down this, this last year in 2016. That, when we get into a building demolition, there's a lot to be taken into that. Um, we we got to make sure we go through the legal process. And if, if I had a dime for every time someone told me to tear our house down, I probably wouldn't be here right now. Um, that's the first thing people say is I have a house that needs to be torn down in my neighborhood. And that's, that's not easy. It's, it's not easy at all. Um, there were, we did have two homes that were torn down um, this year that have been, we've been, they, they went through the legal process and then, like I said, legal process takes time. But what happened, the city didn't tear those houses down. A neighboring property happened to buy that property and take, take it upon themselves to tear it down before the city got involved. So it's just, the, it's, it's not that we don't want to tear down houses, it's that we want to make sure if we have to, we're going to go through the whole entire process. We're going to go through everything legally to make sure it's okay that we do that. Um, one thing we've, we've done more this year is the notice to vacate. Um, this is a house that was just, that was just boarded up recently. Um, it was a house that um, the, the people who had the house lost it to foreclosure. Um, it was in, the, it was the, it was in the, the whole foreclosure process last up to 18 months. And during that time, there was different people that were squatting in the house and they were breaking in. It became a dangerous situation for the neighborhood. Um, so we went ahead and had the house boarded up because we had to get, we had been getting so many calls for PD. Um, notice the vacate, we can do those when we, like we had one this past week where we find out there were no utilities in the house. So there was no water. Water is a big thing. If we find out there's not a, no, no water in the house, it's unfit for human occupancy. That's when we can go ahead and do a notice to vacate. Um, we post the house for notice to vacate, but it takes the court system to actually pull someone. We can't just evict someone out of their house because they don't have water. We can tell them that we want you to vacate the premises, but there's a, there's a lengthy period there to get people out of the house through, through the court process. Um, abandoned, abandoned and substandard manufactured home pilot project. This was a pilot project in 2013. We've done it every year since that. Um, we, have, we did it in 2016. We purchased one mobile home in 2016. Uh, we plan on hopefully, we've already purchased one in 2017. Um, it's basically when a mobile home, pro when a mobile home um, comes for sale on a sheriff's sale, Shauna from zoning will go to that sheriff's sale and bid on it. And if we can buy that home and pay the taxes, we'll haul it to the landfill. So we can remove that home from the park. Um, we have had, you know, in the past, that some of these homes, when they're, when they're abandoned like that, um, that we don't really want them in the park anymore because it's an abandoned home and our, through property maintenance, we can address some things that need to be fixed in the, with that mobile home, but it's better for us to go out and pull those homes out and just haul them to the landfill. So we did do that in 2016. We're gonna to look to do it again in 2017. Like I said, we've already purchased one. Um, for, home foreclosure tracking, something we keep our eyes on, especially with code enforcement. Um, we we wanna make sure that we're keep, we, we, I get on a monthly basis, I, I, I get a listing from community development of the home foreclosures. Um, we're down in 2015. I believe we had 125 foreclosures. We're down, we only had 98 in 2016. So we're down from 2015, but it's something we constantly keep our eyes on. Um, these are, these are um, code enforcement department statistics. Um, the big one that sticks out for me is we, con we conducted 11,683 inspections between health, parks, property maintenance, and zoning in 2016. That was a, an increase from 2015. Uh, we did 1,738 more inspections in 2016 than we did in 2015. So that's just um, when we get those complaints, when we get those calls, it's, it goes back to the response time. Um, we had a letter from the mayor's office 
I received a letter from the mayor's office about a complaint yesterday. Um, by, mid, by midday yesterday afternoon, I'd already gotten status updates from the departments that were involved. So it was the same day. We went out and the, the departments went out and took a look at the thing, took a look at the, the, took a look at the complaints, and those were back. So the, our response time is really good when it comes to that. And then, then it's communication with the, with, the, with, the, with the complainant and the actual the violator too. Um, judicial remedy there, we filed with magistrate court. We had two cases and we had 15 that were, no, we had 12 that were filed through circuit court and small claims actions. We had 45 last year. Primary goal for 2017. Our goal for 2017 is to maintain the balance between code compliance and code enforcement by implementing programs to ensure a minimum standard is met and keep the city of Sioux Falls safe and clean. I think it's a pretty good goal. I think it's a pretty basic goal, but that is when it goes back to our mission statement, our goal is compliance. And our goal is compliance. And we want to keep the city of Sioux Falls safe and clean. So with that, any questions? Wow, 15 minutes flies by there, man. <laughs> yeah. okay. Councillor Neitzer. Thank you. Um, yeah, I do have a handful of things. First sure. thing that sticks out for me is you talked about when the chart from maybe a page back, the number of inspections you have mm -hmm. and then the number of cases yep. and then the number of court actions. It's a very, very incredibly small number that actually get to that level, yep. although, you know, you may hear about them mm -hmm. the loudest, but yes. most of most of the things that you do, people correct. I yes. mean, you get compliance, and you don't have to. You know, that's, it's something we always it's something that it, we always like to say is that we have a ninety percent success rate, right around the ninety percent success rate. So once we notify someone of a problem, the problem usually gets corrected. So that and that's something that, and I don't, I don't like to toot my horn very much for the for the whole team, mm -hmm. but. It is something that we're proud of, and to come out and say, you know, and we do have, there are, there was only 45 court cases last year, um, but there probably are, there's more that are probably on the docket, ready to go, and that, and that's a process. You know, we got to be, the courts doesn't want to hear, the courts don't, they don't want to hear just straight court enforcement cases. You know, they 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 will hear those cases, but um, we got to be kind of selective on how many we just dump down there on them. Sure. Uh, yeah, they, they obviously have a lot to do already. Mm -hmm. um, you, you mentioned affordable housing solutions. I, I know, you know, Wayne Wagner well, and, yeah. and they, do, they do great work. They, they put home, up homes that fit into the character of the neighborhood, and that's yeah. really appreciated, I think. And we, I think most of us counselors did tour the South Summit and 10th Street, the apartments. Really nice. Good. Really nice. It's going to be an asset to that, to that mm -hmm. area. Um, so I guess the one thing, I, and maybe you're ahead of me, would be, I, I will tell you, I did a project trim ride along, which was really eye opening. It was, it was really right. interesting. And um, um, me and Dwayne had a wonderful conversation afterwards. Um, what would be, I don't know if you're already going down this road, but as much as you can when it comes to rental registration and, and, your, and your landlords mm -hmm. is how you can effectively communicate with them. Right. I mean, if, as an example, um, if they're registered and you have some, you know, you maybe put a note on their door or whatever. Maybe there's a way in which they can tick a box and they could get a text message or as much as you can call and anything where we had that discussion when it came to landlords where if he knows that um, it's a rental, mm -hmm. you know, rather than the second time around just putting a tag on a door, yeah. his worker will pick up the, will call them and tell the, the owner that, hey, that this tree still needs to be trimmed sure. because of course that, you know, and, 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 I don't know if there's any in interaction you have between mm -hmm. him and his department and yours where yeah. if you have this rental registration database, maybe they can harness that if they're not already where they can know that, hey, this is a rental. And so maybe we know we need to make, make sure we reach out to them and just the, t the tag on the door as that secondary is not going to be enough. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, that rental registration, that database, is, it's, it's for, it's, it was developed just for that reason, to, have a, to be able to reach out to have a number to get a hold of someone when we get a complaint. So I can only see that, that database, you know, growing. I mean, just in using it in different ways. Um, anymore, the, the days of the phone book are long gone, right? We do have access to phone numbers through utility billing software. So when that's another, that's another avenue that we use all the time, like especially if I get a complaint, like, like during a snow event, if I get a complaint of someone blowing snow out into the street, I can look up 
their I can get their phone number through their utility bill, and I just I'll call them and say, hey, I got a complaint of you blowing snow on your street, and they'll say, man, I did that ten minutes ago, <laughs> and so then it's it's just another way for us to reach out to 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 our citizens rather than you know typing up a letter, sending it in the mail, putting it in there and saying, hey, we 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 found a violation. It's just that quick phone call, and I think that quick phone call goes a long way. And could I ask just one more? Sure. If you don't mind. I just thought of one other thing. The, the mobile home pilot project, yeah. um, does, do, do the owners of those parks, I mean, usually they're renting these lots, do they have a responsibility to, uh, I guess maybe they don't own them, so I guess they can't just pick it up and take it to the dump. Somebody's got to buy it first. Yeah, I see, mean, that, they can't. That's, see, some of those are owner-occupied, some of them are rented. You know, so it, and, the, and the park owners, yes, I do have a responsibility. I mean, it's in, their, it's in our zoning ordinance. It's also in the International Property Maintenance Code that they, make, that they maintain the park themselves. That's the park themselves. But when you get down to an owner-occupied mobile home, that's where, I mean, they're renting. They still have lot rent. So they may own the home, but they're still renting that lot that the home sits on. So when someone walks away from a home, the park doesn't own the home anymore, and that's when we can go actually to the sheriff's sale and purchase that, purchase that home. Sometimes the parks buy them back. Sometimes the parks will buy them back, fix them up, and keep them on, keep them on site. We'll get the ones that we can that are, in, that are in bad shape. Where does the budget come from that, and what, what kind of price are you talking to purchase? We can, we can usually get those for minimal cost, paying the back taxes on some of those. Yeah, 100 bucks. Okay, so basically, sometimes, yeah, sometimes we can get them for 100 bucks, sometimes we can get them for 500 bucks essentially or something. Essentially, if like you that. get the property tax out of arrears, it's yours. It's, I mean, that's then, pretty and much and then, it. Then we, then we have to budget the cost of disposing that. So then we have to haul that to the landfill. And that's where it gets kind of costly. Any other questions or comments? Uh, Councillor Staley. Or do you want it? You can go with whatever you want to go. Sure, sure. Um, Claire Erickson. Thank you, thank you. Um, just piggybacking off of the rental registration, um, you know, we had a tenant that was supposed to be mowing the grass and there was a dispute mm -hmm. that this was this property and this was this yeah. property and so um, neither one would mow it and so I got the letter and so we went and took care of it and that's fine. But that relationship is really nice to have yeah. because I am not there every single day. Mm -hmm. and so to get that letter to know like, hey, you know, I don't know what's going on but so then I was able to remedy it. And so yeah. I appreciate that. It's, it's a great way for um, the communication, uh, especially if you want to be on top of it uh, and keeping up with it on my end anyways. Yeah. I appreciated it. So um, thank you for that. Um, and also, I just want to say about the, the Duluth property. I know Councillor Urbanbach and myself had been working with your department and just want to say thank you so much to all of those involved. Um, I know it's ongoing. I know mm -hmm. it's not going to be done for a while, um, but it certainly has been um, a real thorn for those involved in some of the, that live on the neighborhood that have a desire to clean it up and that are looking at starting a neighborhood crime watch and mm -hmm. doing some of those kinds of things. And so um, it's a long process when somebody, this is, this is their home, it doesn't yep. just happen tomorrow. Um, so I know this is one we've been really communicating and mm -hmm. working on for some time. So thank you for, for all your efforts to everyone involved for, for that. Um, the other thing I just wanted you to discuss a teeny tiny bit um, in regards to code enforcement, how you get to where you get. Um, I think that sometimes in the community there's a perception that you're out driving around in the car and yeah. with your notepad um, checking off all those that might have no. bad shingles or bad this mm -hmm. or you know your grass is too long or however it is because there are communities that do that. Oh, yeah. um, I've, I've sat in the code enforcement breakout sessions and there are communities that do that. That's mm -hmm. what they, they feel is important but talk to me a little bit about sure. how we get to where we are and the process and how that works. Yep, so right now, um, we, our code enforcement is basically on a complaint basis. Um, when we receive a call, whether it, be a, it, whether it be a health issue, whether it be a zoning issue, but it takes a complaint. Now, I will tell you that, like I'll say property maintenance, if we get one complaint of someone not shoveling their sidewalk, we don't just go to that one house, and we may look down the block, and then we'll address those as they go down the block. We're, but we typically try to deal with those on a complaint basis only. If we see something that's next door, uh, if we get a complaint for a car in the front yard and there's a car in the front yard next door, we're going to address that. But we have, though, in, in a very limited basis, we've done, more, we've done some proactive code enforcement. 
where we actually go out and we'll canvas a neighborhood. And that, that, those decisions aren't just me, they're, not ju they're more of a team decision. And we'll talk about that before we do that. And like I said, they're very limited. For the most part, uh, no, for all, all the time, it's on a complaint basis like that. Thank and then you. once we get the complaint, then we'll address it. Thank you. Yep. Okay, Councillor Staley. Well, first of all, I wanted to say I so appreciate Officer Kyle Johnson sitting out here. Uh, he is the head of the Neighborhood Watch program. I have worked with him this last year to try to encourage more people to do that. And I also appreciate your kind and caring attitude Thank you. because the last thing I want is to come down on people with a heavy rod and we want to help people. Yep. Um, I've got a few comments. I, I'll sure. do this quickly. but. Uh, you have the quote on page one, your most unhappy customers are your greatest source of learning. Mm -hmm. And I guess uh, this is kind of off on a side road, but I would say let's remember that when it comes to Snowgate service, because hopefully we'll continue to learn from that as mm -hmm. well. It's not always just uh, people uh, being come down, having ramifications from city sure. ordinances. Um, and to piggyback with that, I wanted to go to page six. And you've got the who to contact thing. Yep. I think on there we need to have Snowgate service and concerns sure. with snow removal sure. that city, citizens have for the city. <clears throat> and also, I think it'd be beneficial to have a number to call if you have concerns about a city employee. You know, if you see something and you think there's an inefficiency happening, mm -hmm. I mean, that it's not just about the city watching over the citizens. Mm -hmm. We should be able to have input into that as well. So that just some. Uh, some suggestions and then on pay you have the neighborhood project nice and keep yep. I've been a, a beneficiary of that in the past mm -hmm. it really is nice I have I know the city of Brookings and Fargo a lot of communities do that citywide yep. and I think if we would put that out to our citizens and say would you like some of your tax money to be used for this it would be a resounding yes uh, so I, I would be an advocate of expanding that program but I had a question about the guy at Norton Froelich, I believe, who paid yeah. for those dumpsters. How much would that have cost, do you think? Boy, I don't know. I know the, um, after speaking with him, and when he brought the idea up, the waste hauler who provided the dumpsters gave them to him, gave them to him at a very, very discounted rate. Well, I mean, we're talking $150, $200. Probably a couple hundred dollars per dumpster. And how many did he have? I think he had several. So he might have invested a thousand dollars for this. Oh, yeah. Bless his heart. That Could have, probably, probably even more at the end of the day. He probably did. So. Okay, and then a question about re rental rehab program mm -hmm. um, on page thirteen. It says this program is available to rental housing property owners with residential within the boundaries of the defined program. Mm -hmm. Who pays for that? That's through grant funds. That's through grant funds th over overseen by the community development department. So a, a landlord can get money from yes. community to rehab their to rehab. properties. Yep. Okay. Yep. So it's a they pay it it'd back. Be, it'd be more of a revolving. Sorry about that. It'd be more of a revolving. Loan so it would be the same thing as like the citizens able to use community development money to mm -hmm. to take care of their. Yep. Excellent. And then the last thing I wanted was going to ask about is the, the rental situation. You said that you want to get everyone registered. Mm -hmm. Let's say that. Councillor Starr leaves town for a year, and he wants to rent his house out to a college student, and then but he's coming back. So would he be required to to do that as well, or how, how does that? Play you know, out? that's that's something we would like to see that have it to have it um, be registered as a rental during that time. It'd be in it'd be in Councillor Starr's best interest to do that because if he's not here, and he's relying on somebody else to maintain his property, um, it would be beneficial to him. Because ultimately, if we were to get any kind of complaints, where the, those letters don't go to the tenant, they go to the property owner. So it'd be a, it'd be a, 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 a big benefit for council star to do that. Is the multi housing association pretty much in support of this? Y yes, yes. The multi housing association, um, where they, they've been a supporter of the rental registration program for for, for, for since its existence. So they're they're a big backer of it. Yeah, and that one, one more little thing. Mm -hmm. uh, on that boulevard ordinance that I love, mm -hmm. uh, I, I do think we're going to have a problem moving forward with the rock part. Sure. And I, there's actually McGreevy Clinic over by on 7th Avenue. The whole boulevard is covered in rocks. Sure. So that we may need to, you're doing the soft enforcement yes. this year, is that correct? Yes, yep. We so want I, I think there may be a need for the council to maybe look that yep. over. Yep, you bet. Okay. 
Uh, Mr. Any Mr. other questions or comments? Mr. Chair. Yes, Councillor Starr. Yep, I, I want to add to uh, what Councillor Staley talked a little bit about the uh, program up in the Folic edition, and Mr. Yeah. Little did a uh, an incredible job, and I think it got out of his control rather it quickly did. because uh, people from around the city and outside of the city, I think, uh, um, they left the, the dumpsters or the roll-offs there a little bit too long mm -hmm. and uh, over the weekend, and they got filled with a, a lot of trash. Yeah. Um, my point being is that... Um, when someone considers doing a project like this and that cleanup, if they contact the city, you know, Monday and Tuesday, Director Cotter with Public Works worked with them because people um, disposed of tires, yep. uh, electronics, that uh, it wasn't just a matter of, you know, sending a truck over, but mm -hmm. uh, Galen Huber did end up sending oh, yeah. a couple of trucks. We were able to, to collect the electronics and yep. get them in the right place. And I think Mr. Little got a, a refund on the tipping fees yeah. the, to empty the dumpsters as well. So. Mm -hmm. The city has that ability to help if our citizens reach out to us and, and yeah. work with our department. That was something I was, I was with uh, uh, Trent Lubers, Utility Operations Superintendent, and Trent and I actually spoke with Mr. Little and said, we love what you did, but next time call us. <laughs> Luckily, you know, there was still some grant money to yes. dispose of the tires yeah. and some things with the mattresses. And it was something that he had a, a, a real need to, that he wanted to take care of his neighborhood yeah. and and i really respect that but mm -hmm. um it got overwhelming rather yeah. quickly so yeah, and, the, and the help came and so mm -hmm. more thank you than anything mm -hmm. to with uh, the street department to be able to bring some yeah. dump trucks and um before you know it the it was a bigger problem because some of the people cleaned out their backyards and other people came and scavenged through the uh, dumpsters and the uh, and it went back into other uh, backyards so luckily yep. we were able to get rid of a lot of the stuff before yeah. it uh, it went to the landfill rather than to another person's mm -hmm. backyard. So. And that actually is an area that um, is part of our project nice and keep this year. Uh, we're gonna hit that area again. We haven't hit that area full force like that with city staff. Um, it's been a number of years since we've been in that area. And we'll also be in the Norton area right to the, to the east of that as well too. So it's gonna be part of our project nice and keep this year, those two areas, so. Great, and then and mentioning the, uh, you talked about the street lights and stuff in yeah. that same, same area, there were concerns about uh, lighting and yeah. the amount of crime and things going on that, that could prevent that. So as you look at trees and, mm -hmm. and trimming um, around uh, lighting and some darker ends, yep. some of those streets dead end into the yeah. cemetery mm -hmm. and, and things. So mm -hmm. I appreciate everything Thank you're you. doing to, to make that better. Thank you. Is that true? Any other questions or comments for Mr. Tobias? Matt, um, thank you very much. I had uh, indicated when you first came up following Sculpture Walk with code enforcement, that's a tough act to follow, yeah. especially with your subject matter, but you did a fine job, and I think it epitomizes the effort and the, the, the care and the empathy and the kindness that you bring to your, your difficult job, and I credit your team mm -hmm. uh, for that success as well. So. Great job, and great job of incorporating, as Councillor Staley had mentioned, uh, Mr. Bill Gates' uh, philosophy yeah. uh, and adopting that as, as your own. I think mm -hmm. that, uh, again, reflects very positively on you. The uh, increase of over 1,000 inspections, mm -hmm. I mean, that's well over a 10% increase from the previous yeah. year. Did we uh, increase your staff by more than 10%? Uh, no. <laughs> no, not at all. Well, the, uh, there again, that's a, a great reflection on you and the work yeah. uh, that you perform as well as the others. So uh, please keep up the good work. And then lastly, your goal is a very good and admirable goal to, uh, to maintain the balance between code compliance and code enforcement by implementing programs to assure a minimum standard is met and keep the city of Sioux Falls safe and clean. I mean, the city isn't what it is by accident. It's because of your efforts, it's because of ordinances that the city and the zoning and planning uh, ordinance that, that this council adopts and then that you enforce. Mm -hmm. We've all been to other cities around the area where they're not as attractive and beautiful. And obviously, they are attracting individuals every year, as in the case of this past year when we attracted over 5,000 new residents to the city of Sioux Falls. And I think it's even more important when, when we continue to attract new individuals to our community that we do come forth with an education effort to let them know what our, our codes are yep. uh, in an effort to 
uh, prevent violations before they ever take place. Mm -hmm. So great job. Yep, thank you. And thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. Okay, our next topic is Sioux Falls Thrive and, and Housing Needs Assessment. And uh, Candy Hansen with Sioux Falls Thrive is going to present on this topic. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much and welcome. Thank you, Chairman Kiley, and thanks to all the counselors for being with us today. I am Candy Hansen. I'm president of Sioux Falls Thrive, one of the newest nonprofits in our town. And I have with me today Suzanne Smith, who is the Senior Research Associate for Augustana Research Institute. So we have tried to condense a 30-minute presentation into 10 minutes. We're going to talk real fast at you, but we want to know, um, want to be able to answer any questions you might have. Did somebody, Jim, can you find it? And there it is. And there it is. Thank you. Um, Sioux Falls Thrive traces its roots to two different planning projects, Sioux Falls Tomorrow in 2014 and Forward Sioux Falls the following year. It's very interesting that in both of those planning projects, in one, a group of citizens raised concern about the growing level of poverty in the Sioux Falls area and its effect on children and their education. And we turned around the next year, brought in at, at um, Market Street Services from Atlanta, who came to the same conclusion. In fact, this is what they said about the situation that we're facing in our community today. Their contention was that we don't have so much a short-term workforce problem. We have a long-term workforce problem. We have too many poor children growing up in the city whose parents don't have the resources to help them through school. So when Forward Sioux Falls adopted its 11 initiatives, they targeted four for this year. The first three on the screen you'll see are very typical of things the Chamber and Development Foundation do. The fourth one was a new one for us. And so it came over on a temporary basement to the Sioux, basis to the Sioux Falls Area Community Foundation and landed on my desk. I started researching Cradle to Career and found out this is the kind of continuum that we look at when we track children's progress. Beginning by the time when we get them in kindergarten, we can tell how well prepared they are for their school and follows through through high school graduation and then post-secondary degree completion. Now the interesting thing about cradle to career initiatives is that they don't focus on what's going in the classroom. We've been doing that for the past 20 to 30 years. It focuses on the conditions around the classroom, the ecosystem that supports the school system. Because when you have children from low-income families, they come into a mainstream society for a few hours a day. And for three quarters of the year, they're back coming in and living in the same conditions with which they entered. So you have to look at what's going on around the schools and whether the families that whose children are going through have the support they need to make it through. The other thing that um, Market Street um, Services gave to me were two different career models to look at, one the Strive Together Network and one Alignment Nashville. I was shocked when I saw the Strive Together um, map and saw that there were 69 communities uh, in the network and nothing in the north central plain i realized later on it was probably because most of them started on the heels of the great recession which did not affect this area of the country as much as it did other places harvard says there's actually 150 cradle to career initiatives going on in the country and what I, the only thing i can say about that's good about that is that I've had a lot of people to borrow information from. Especially Alignment Nashville, that is one of the oldest. It has about 12 years of experience. And when they started tracking movement along that cradle to career continuum, they managed in 10 years to increase their high school graduation rate from 62 to 82%. And when they looked at the health and wellness sector and focused there in seven years, they managed to decrease their teen pregnancy rate from 43% to 16%. Now this is an urban school system, and but this is a school system or a city that's come together, the whole community, and set up 15 different ta um, alignment teams to bring programs together and to keep people from falling through the cracks. That seemed, um, 
uh, a really good idea. So you start looking into how they do it and they work with something called collective impact. I call that collaboration on steroids. And there are three things that you should probably remember about it. First of all, when you come in, you don't look at the community from the basis of need. You look at the community and assume that the resources are there to provide support, but they're disconnected, they're siloed. So we become a city or a community that's called program rich and system poor. So collective impact is looking at bringing down silos and turning them into systems. It is exceptionally data driven because you're going to have to be able to track whether what you're doing is going to help children along the way against that continuum. And it also is unique in that it calls for action teams that bring in business, government, nonprofits, and faith-based sectors to do complex problem solving. There's actually a set of tools that we use to look at the complexity and um, uh, some performance excellent standards we want our teams to be using. Now those are the five conditions for collective, Im collective impact. I'm just going to emphasize two of them. The second one down, shared measurement. I've told you how important data collection is and, and actually be having the research to start a group off on the right foot. And that's um, something that Augie is going to tell you about in a minute. And then the very last bar down there, the backbone support. It, um, that's what Thrive is. It's a backbone organization. We're going to provide the glue that people can voluntarily come together and try and work on some of our complex problems. Now it sounded awfully good um, based on other communities' experience, but we wanted to know whether there was potential for doing this successfully in Sioux Falls. And so the four founding organizations of Sioux Falls Thrive um, talked to Augustana, and we had them do an affordable housing needs assessment last year primarily because more than 900 of our school-aged children were temporarily homeless during the school year, the academic year, and it's pretty hard to believe that a child can come to school ready to learn if they don't know where they're sleeping. And because there was so much enthusiasm, we have a lot of groups working in affordable housing that have been a lot, very frustrated. So I'm going to introduce to you now Suzanne Smith, the uh, Senior Research Associate from Augustana to take you through a few slides. Welcome, Suzanne. Thank you. Thanks for having us. So when we set off to do this affordable housing needs assessment, it was a pretty large mandate. Um, I'm gonna run you through the research outline without getting into too much detail. Our first goal was to simply quantify and project affordable housing needs. How many people in Sioux Falls can afford or not afford where they're living? And what would we need to do in order to provide enough units for everyone to afford the place that they live? We also wanted to inventory client needs. So we went directly to uh, families and individuals at income levels that make it tough to afford housing and we asked them, what are some of the barriers that prevent you from finding or keeping affordable housing? Third, and something that's a little less traditional in affordable housing studies, we wanted to map the organizational ecosystem. Who are the providers, who are the players right now that contribute to affordable housing? Uh, and how well networked are they? How do they interact with one another? And then finally, the report compares some of the best practices from across the country when it comes to affordable housing. So to begin, we asked, what's affordable? Sioux Falls is affordable. If you look at the largest metro areas in the country, ranked from San Francisco, the most expensive city for both renters and homeowners, to Wheeling, West Virginia, which is the most affordable, Sioux Falls falls right in the middle in terms of affordability for homeowners. And well towards the affordable side of the spectrum for renters. I will tell you the 2016 numbers just came out to update this and we dropped from 112 to 106 for homeowners and from 187 to 183 for renters. So we have become slightly less affordable. However, the real problem with this number and comparisons like these is that they're just based on median income and median home value or median rent. So what they don't tell you is what the distribution looks like. We dug a little bit deeper and looked at the distribution of units by monthly rent. So that's what you see across the bottom there. In, in blue, 
you have the number of units that rent for about that monthly amount. In red is the number of renter households whose income would allow them to pay 30% or less toward that rent. So for example, if you work full-time at about $10 an hour, bring home a little over $20,000 a year, you could afford $500 per month in rent, you'd be in that second bracket. Looking at this distribution, you can see that Sioux Falls has plenty of moderate rent units right there in the middle, but we don't have a whole lot of very affordable units for those low income families. Overall, there's about a 3,700 unit gap for people who are at or below uh, about 30% of the median income. If you look at cost burden in Sioux Falls, families that uh, bring home $35,000 annually, that's about half of the median income in our city. Over two thirds of them are cost burdened, so they're living in housing they can't afford. They're paying more than 30% of their income for housing. Families that make $20,000 or less a year, so around 30% of our median, 60% of those families pay over half of their income toward housing. Thrive is especially concerned with children. So we did uh, continually in the report come back and ask what does this mean in terms of children and their families. Um, in Sioux Falls, we have seen growth in the number of children over the past five years or so. That number has increased about 13%. However, the number of children living in poverty has grown much faster, 48% from 2010 to 2015. We also know that children living in poverty are very likely to live with single mothers. 72% of kids in poverty live with a single mother. And in Sioux Falls, although the median income for a married couple family is over $80,000 a year, single moms bring home on average about $26,000 a year. So when we talk about families who are struggling to afford affordable housing, many of those families are single mothers with kids. Um, Candy already mentioned to you one more metric to uh, measure need for affordable housing among children. Last year, the Sioux Falls School District counted 965 children who were homeless at some point during the year. That number has been elevated since 2008 uh, and has not fallen off significantly since then. So moving beyond the numbers, we wanted to understand the organizational ecosystem, what's available in the community to meet the needs of people who do not have affordable housing. Uh, and we found there are lots of programs available. Uh, this map shows you an array of programs that are designed to meet different needs associated with housing. So you see a sort of circle of red dots. Those are different needs, things like uh, substance abuse treatment or uh, training, technical skills and education, um, rental assistance, security deposits. And connected to each of those red dots are all of the different programs designed to support families in meeting those needs. Sioux Falls has no shortage of programs to meet needs. The problem is that this web is very difficult to navigate not only for families and individuals who need to access these services, but even for the case managers and caseworkers who try to navigate it as part of their daily jobs. Over and over again, I heard from both uh, people looking for affordable housing and from stakeholders, the caseworkers, the, the directors of nonprofits, um, that something needs to change. We can't continue forward and expect to solve the affordable housing problem. We can't build our way out. We can't buy our way out. What it's going to take is better coordination of the programs that exist working across the silos. So in summary, very briefly, Sioux Falls has abundant moderately priced housing. However, we have a disappearing middle class like you see nationally in Sioux Falls. There is uh, population growth at the high and low ends of the income spectrum, but not in the middle of the income spectrum where we have ample housing. We have a growing number of children and families in particular who are living in poverty, and we have a housing gap for those low income families. The good news, Sioux Falls has many programs for families in need, but those programs exist in a complex and co fragmented ecosystem that makes it difficult for families to find the resources that they need. And I'll turn it back over to Candy to explain Sioux Falls Thrive and how they'll move forward. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, so just very briefly, we um, had to start out with the mission statement. We knew once the pilot project was done that we are following the pattern that many communities need to follow now. 
complex problems, resources, and somehow not getting the bang for the buck that we should and helping the people in the way we should really help them. So you see the mission statement again, this is cross-sector, business, government, nonprofit, faith-based sector coming together to figure out how to bring things into alignment so that kids can thrive and reach their optimal educational and career potential. We um, have this organizational chart that's been holding up for quite a while. On the top, you'll see the four organizations that actually founded Thrive. They're the same four that paid for the pilot project, uh, the cost of which was matched by Augustana University. Um, and that's United Way, the Chamber of Commerce, Development Foundation, and Community Foundation. They, in turn, appoint a uh, board of directors so that the board is always responsible back to the four initial founders. They have a strategy council to advise them. The big circle you see around the center is a communication loop. That's one of the backbone's um, jobs. And the small dots in the center are action teams. Remember now, we have one action team starting, housing, but Nashville has 15 over the 10 years that they've evolved. And you see at the base our support from Augustana Research Institute handling all of the data collection and management that's going to help us move ahead. On the sides, you see something I've labeled engage, engagement collaboratives. That's because we do have a lot of small programs going on in Sioux Falls with lots of potential, but they're not system-based yet. I think of the Hope Coalition, which is faith-based, and wanting to start three preschools near three of our Title I schools. Um, but we want them to be part of the network. They have a lot of potential. I think I have one more slide. Just uh, again, oh, there's the board of directors. Uh, we've existed since January 9th, and um, we're very grateful to the people in our community who have stepped forward to lead in a governance and stewardship aspect. But um, this is really how the work is going to get broken down. The strategy council consists of 15 representatives from the organizations in our community pouring the most resources into supporting people who stand in need. There are two representatives from the city, the health department and community development. There are two representatives from the United Way. There's one from the community foundation. There's uh, one from uh, the county. All organizations that are pouring resources forward and should be very motivated to find the efficiencies when you pull down silos and create systems. I told you that the Strategy Council will appoint the action teams. We're going to follow the Nashville model. Um, we have so many people trying to volunteer for the housing project. We're taking applications. The Strategy Council will meet on uh, March 29th to get the application out. We hope to have that first action team going um, in April. And then we have our engagement collaboratives. Uh, over time, what we're providing the Strategy Council with is pretty much glue, bringing them together. The action teams will get professional facilitation, support from Augustana Research, training in Baldridge, and um, continuous quality improvement tools. And then the engagement collaboratives, we hope over time to develop a core of volunteers that can help with training and bringing those groups along so that they can have a greater impact. Thank you so much. Are there any questions? I know, Pat, you've seen this before. So. Candy and Suzanne, thank you much for your presentation. I'll open it up to the counselors. Counselor uh, Neitzer. Yeah, I just wanted to commend you for this. And also, uh, last week at the county commission meeting, I watched that on, online. Oh, did you? And I would recommend everybody go on YouTube. It's March 14th meeting of last week. There was an extended presentation. And yeah. you had some st statistics that were really you know, it's as far as uh, reading levels and I think math levels mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, the, the trajectory of, of whether you're going to graduate high school that were quite stark. Yeah, but one thing that we know is that if you're not reading at grade level in third grade or uh, math, doing math at the algebra one level, the odds of your graduating high school drop by 75%. And we're talking about children who go home to parents who do not have time may not have a high school education themselves, may not have English as a first language, expecting them to help those children get through school. So this is vital to our community and to what we're going to be able to provide in the way of a workforce and how many lives will be affected 
if we can be successful. But you know, I kind of bet on Sioux Falls whenever I have a chance. Councilor Knight, sir, go ahead and continue. Yeah, one, one more thing. So um, that ecosystem, it's such a mess of lines, like you said, it's uh, what was it, program rich and system poor? That's that what, right? exactly what it shows. We're program rich and system poor. Yeah, so you were looking at, um, at how to uh, untangle that ecosystem and, and talking about what actions to take first, I think. But um, are, are, is your organization, your group, going to be looking uh, sooner than later at how to figure out, you know, if I'm somebody in need, where do I go? How do you untangle this and get all these people to start working together and not to be, you know, recreating the wheel and having all these disparate groups? <laughs> That's what the board will charge the action committee with. Their first job is to untangle that pile of spaghetti and figure out how to um, make it so that you can find homes for 965 <laughs> children. Now, when you do that and you untangle it, you're actually improving things for everybody, right? Um, but we're saying this is about kids, so the first thing you do is, is focus on untangling it for uh, families with children. As the group matures and figures out systems, we know that they'll move on to other things that a lot of people are eager to talk about, which is maybe some new ways to improve um, what we've got in, the, in town as far as affordable housing. But we're starting with kids. Councillor Erickson. Thank you. Um, sorry, I'm just writing a note before I forget because <laughs> I have kids and so my mind goes, goes awry sometimes. Um, I'm just looking at the, the fifth page where we're talking about what's affordable and then incre um, increasing income inequity. Um, I'm looking at those two. I know this is really early. Um, first of all, thank you for the presentation. I think this is really um, fantastic information. Um, that shows we have an issue in our community. Um, as we discuss kind of the, the income and the amount, um, I, again, I know this is early. However, is there going to be a, a goal to try to increase that certain level to get it at that lower income level? Because certainly we have a bigger issue at that 250 to 499, and then you see it shift again. Um, is that where the focus will be, or is this really, I mean, I understand you're gonna first untangle the web, but that's where it looks, just for me looking at it, um, what you can talk about with that a little bit more. Well, I will say from my point of view, which is to gather the data and report it, um, I think the usefulness of having the data in front of us is that we can see that gap and identify where it might be most appropriate to focus efforts, but it'll be up to the action team and the members of the action team to sort of think about um, how to begin to tackle that. Right. Thank you. And then also, as we untangle that web, it's, I mean, identifying those children and bringing them to the resources, to the homes. I mean, that's going to be the tricky part, making sure everyone is connected. Will there be work with the school district as well? I mean, we have six school districts within, I think six, in Sioux Falls. How, how does that work along those lines as well? Well, we are focused right now on the Sioux Falls School District. And yes, there are two representatives from the school district on the strategy council that will target um, the action teams and also decide who needs to be on that action team. So um, we are working very closely. We are open to aligning with the other districts. Right now they're not really experiencing the same kinds of challenges that we're experiencing in this district. Okay. So we expect them as things change and their population changes to maybe be able to take advantage. We're also very aware that most of those programs do serve the four county area and are based in Sioux Falls. So when we're untangling the web in Sioux Falls, um, we're actually helping the Sioux Falls area. Thank you so much. Councilor Staley. Uh, first of all, Councilor Kiley, I know you made reference to how many new people came to town last year. Was that like 4,000, did you say? 5,000. 5,000. So, Candy, the, the question I have, and I think this would be interesting to track for a number of years, um, but let's talk about this 5,000. Have you done any studies to say what the income levels are for these 5,000 people? I'm going to ask Suzanne if she looked at that. We, we do have projections, yes. 
In fact, um, uh, projections are, of course, based on, on past data. That's all that we have. That's all that we know. So our projections are based on this trend that we've identified from 2008 to 2015, which is that um, the people who are coming or staying, depending on how you look at it, are people who do tend to have uh, high incomes or low incomes. So they tend to be at those two extremes of the spectrum versus moderate income households. So, we've actually seen some so we could say the people moving to Sioux Falls. I mean, it looks it looks like the bigger amount is the the higher incomes. That's right. That, so we would say out of the five thousand, we could say like sixty five percent are high income people, or we don't. Well, and, and let me tell you, the reason I'm, w I'm wondering this is because we're dealing on the council with the lowering the softening sales tax issue, and I've, I've wondered. As, and it's been brought up in the community, if people are so taxed with finding housing and food that they don't have a lot of extra expendable income, and so we're just not spending as much. So it, I think it would be interesting to really track those numbers and to say, you know, 75% are over 100,000 or, or whatever. So, so we have a, a handle on that. And the second thing, you talked about children and, and making sure they thrive, and I think that's fabulous. And I just recently had a conversation with a woman who's retired and she's mentoring a child. And just, she said, these kids don't even have any one-on-one -on -one time. She listens to them. And then I think one of the TV stations did a story about a guy who reads to children. And some of the kids even stayed in from recess to have someone, or, or they read to him, to have someone give them that, that caring. So is that part of the program too, to encourage people to give their time? Counselor State. Councillor Staley, that's what I mean by those engagement collaboratives. They're the small, wonderful things going on in Sioux Falls that we want to bring them into that network and see if we can do some expansion and some improvements there too. There are a lot of great programs like that going on. We want them all to be part of this. Councillor Selberg. Thank you, Councillor Kiley. What a great presentation. I'm safe to say you've, you've got your work cut out for you, I'd say. That was a pretty mind-blowing 15 minutes. Um, it's pretty sobering statistics. I mean, we always talk about our highlights in this city, but when you hear things like we've just heard, we've got a lot of work to do. Um, it just started in January, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. I, well, I would hope, and I guess I don't have a lot of questions, just more of a congratulations on what you're doing. Thank you for coming, and I hope you'll come often and let us know how it's going. And I know I'll be looking more into this, too, and what we can do to help. But, um, yeah, what you're doing is just crucial for the future of the city. I mean, some of these things you talk about, you know, the ecosystems that you're forming around the schools, the cradle-to-career initiatives. I mean, yeah, it's just I found it fascinating. I wish we could hear some more, but come back soon. We'd Thank love you. to do that. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the from the council? I just have a, a few of my own. And uh, as a uh, educator that uh, served a 33-year career, uh, I know firsthand the effect that poverty has on the ability of a child to learn on their cognitive abilities. And as I've mentioned before, it's difficult. It was difficult for me as a classroom educator to place a emphasis on a child to turn in their assignment for the next day when I knew that they didn't have a place to live that evening. Um, so there, it's, it's, it's a huge challenge. And uh, Suzanne, your congratulations with your needs assessment. I mean, it's a, it's a lot of data that has identified really a multitude of issues or problems. And I can see going, moving forward especially using research methodology, that the problem is to isolate that down to a single issue and then try to work and resolve that um, so that you are most effective and get the biggest bang for your dollar. And with your action teams, do you perceive, and with so many issues that have been identified, do you perceive that you'll have, and in one of your earlier graphics you did show multitude Several. a multitude of action yeah. teams so is it safe to assume that with the separate uh, problems that have been identified that you're going to have separate teams working on separate issues it's absolutely the way we'd like it to work and Suzanne will you hold up the cover of your paper one of the things I would say um, 
I was a consultant for years in Sioux Falls. And one of the things that we'd bump into in problem solving is we'd get a group together and somebody would say, well, how many new families were there in Sioux Falls last year? And what is the average income? So each action team, we want to ground with a study like this. You know, if we decide, if the council decides to go after food or whether they go after after school programs, whatever the action teams form is going to be able to work from a basis of knowledge and not spend 12 months just trying to figure out, you know, and put the ducks in the row. So that's what will happen. One of the things in my research I learned was that there were some communities that tried to do 15 task forces all at once and they collapse in on themselves. So we hope to have Augie um, uh, and Augie Research Institute and the team over there, uh, another project identified for uh, this spring and then have them doing some research this fall so we can have a second action team. But that's the pattern we hope to follow. We think that's the way to, to do it right. Yes, it sounds like you're on the right path and I wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Thank you very much, because this is such a, I mean, it's not only an economic development issue, a workforce development issue, but it's really a humanitarian issue and offering housing uh, and the quality of life to everybody, so. I would just add, if you want a copy of the full report, you can find it at augie.edu slash findings or the Sioux Falls Thrive website. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, ladies. All right, that's our last uh, item on the agenda, and the Land Use Committee will begin in 10 minutes, so we'll start the Land Use Committee at 6 o'clock. This meeting is adjourned.